And welcome back to the Remedial Film Class Podcast. I'm your host, Dan. And I'm Travis. And I'm George. And George was in for a treat tonight because he's watching a movie from a director he's heard of, which, nice. has that ever happened before? Um, No. No, yeah. it hasn't. Yes, Mm-mm. it has. <laughs> no. Uh, no. Never. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think he owns like three or four of this director's movies in his collection. I'd never even heard of this one. That's what was fun because really? I'm like, the the uh, the movie to follow Dirty Harry would have been like Reservoir Dogs or mm-hmm. Pulp Fiction, but mm-hmm. we're like he's seen those, so let's get the old Jackie Brown out. So yeah, we're we watched uh, Jackie Brown this week, George. You just uh, finished up the. I assume it was on VHS, right? <laughs> yes. Were yes, you kind? Course. Did you rewind? Not yet. Ooh, VHS party Prime. foul. I always <laughs> press pause when the at the beginning of the credits so that I don't forget any of the characters' names. names. Yeah. I'm you recording those, like, this in the same room as my TV, and so the character list is right there. So, so now the, the tracking's going to be off. Tracking lines <laughs> at the top and bottom, they're kind of <laughs> jittering on the screen. Yeah, a little bit. Nice. <laughs> oh, that brings me back. Oh, yeah. Ugh, let's not go back. Hey, uh, Jackie Brown, though, George, you've seen which of the Tarantinos? Um, I've seen Reservoir Dogs. I've seen Pulp Fiction. I've seen uh, Django. I've seen um, Death Proof. Wow. Really? Um, that one I didn't think you would have seen. Yeah. Huh. What other ones are there? Uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood? Yeah. I have heard of that, but I haven't seen it. Inglorious D- Bastards? Yeah, he did Bastards. I've seen, I've seen mm-hmm. that, yeah. So you're a Tarantino fan. You actually, yeah. Fan. This is like the one little vein of movies you actually know something about. Weird. Well, this yeah, because they're good. This is your this is your bird with well, the crystal plumage. Yeah, I found a good director, <laughs> and I was like, oh, let me watch all of his stuff. Yes, that's good. Well, somehow you missed... Jackie Brown, though. Yeah, how did that happen? I don't know. <laughs> We're going to find out. We're going to have to talk about that. So, as we get started tonight, George, normally uh, I might ask you for your notes. This one, I don't, I'm not going to ask you for your notes. Instead, I'm going to ask you for your initial impressions. Having never heard of the movie, uh, we got a text from you at some point saying, oh, I'm watching a Tarantino. How far into the movie? Were we talking like credits or... Did you spoil uh, it by looking at the DVD case, or when did no, you it know it was a Tarantino? Opening credits. So at least we got you past the prime menu before you realized. Yes. I'm sure the opening music gave it away. <laughs> I mean, why would the opening movie or the music give Just it away? Just that, that, that uh, like I said before, like that, that Shaft-type music he uses a lot in his movies. That sixties, I hadn't late, noticed late sixties, early seventies music. I hadn't noticed. I just thought that this was going to be that, you know, disco era. It was going to take place in that era. I figured that's why you picked that. For that a minute, I was music. afraid you were calling this music disco, and I was afraid that all your guitar amps were going to become sentient and just murder <laughs> you on air. <laughs> <laughs> which you know. You might have deserved. Uh, had no, you called it's this like disco. funk, right? This is yeah, it's like it's soul Motown and, and this is jazz, it's soul and funk, the good yeah, it's stuff, jazzy. man. It's good stuff. It's yeah, it's good stuff. So the first thing out of the gate, you hit the soundtrack. The soundtrack hits you, really. Oh God, the soundtrack is a, is awesome, dude. This soundtrack changed my whole like worldview when I first mm. saw this. You know, fifteen years ago or whatever. Uh, the strawberry number twenty three, that one, uh, was my ringtone for mm-hmm. five years when having cool ringtones was a thing. Mm. I remember that. Across 110th Street. I mean, mm. I mean. Mm. Oh, the Delphonics. Mm-hmm. Oh, and the Del- I played the Delphonics tonight because after watching the movie again, I had to listen to more music. And my kid, yeah. go- my eight-year-old kid goes, I've heard this before. And I said, yes, because your dad's Damn good. Right, <laughs> your dad treats you right. All right. I was telling George like that's that's the music I grew up on, between that and the Motown stuff, and you know anything that could be turned into acapella. This music is is the shit. So nostalgia Travis kind of watched it on a 
I was very nostalgic. Yeah. Plus, word. Plus, it was filmed in the '90s, which is also a good time for me. Late '90s. Yeah, but it kind of had that early '90s feel. It had. I don't know. Earlier why. than that. Yeah, it was I like thought. late '80s, kind of like I mid '80s. It felt like the late '70s. It was. Uh, I don't know. Uh, the clothing didn't do that. I guess it was late '70s, early. I don't 80s. know. I wasn't yeah. alive. Yeah, it might have been my early childhood, so early '80s maybe. I just hear that music and I think of the '70s. Yeah. But well, and I think you're hitting. Uh, I think you're you're describing what they were trying to do to your nostalgia feelings, mm-hmm. uh, George. Uh, not that you have them because you were uh, not born yet. Mm. But one of the major themes of this movie is you know aging and kind of maintaining what you were despite the fact you're now 20 years older. Yes. Right. Uh, that's a big part of it. They hit it pretty on the nose. I mean, it's not a subtle, yeah. subtle theme. Now, one thing I don't know if you're aware of this, do you have any idea who any of these actors are besides Batman? <laughs> besides Batman? He knows a few. I mean, I, mean, I he know knows Sam Jackson. Samuel L. Jackson yeah. is, yeah. yeah. Um, you know De Niro, De Niro right? yeah. It was fantastic, mm. by the way. Fuck <laughs> He's um, so willing to take such a small part, but then make mm-hmm. it uh, like a show stealer. I, I really appreciated his effort in this. Well, what I noticed was he kind of, it was like a solid to Sam Jackson. Because Sam Jackson does that bit part in Goodfellas. So it's like, it's almost like a flip reversal. Yeah, like Sam Jackson's a, a smaller part in Goodfellas. I'll be looking for him when I watch yes. Goodfellas. So it's kind. it was kind of funny to see De Niro take the back seat. Dude, I've never movie. seen De Niro play a role like this yeah. ever. Like it was great. Dude, that's like, <laughs> you know, he's like, I don't want to say like over the top actor, but like every not, he's he's the main attraction in almost every movie yeah. he's in. He brings and, attention to himself, right? And Definitely. this he 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 still managed to do that somehow with just being like the dopey, mm-hmm. you know. It's that style of actor, like Gandolfini. Uh, is in a movie called Get Shorty. Okay. It's a Travolta movie. Okay. And it's got like Delroy Linda, like all these people in it that are just huge, big personalities. Mm-hmm. And I think Gandolfini plays a, a, a stuntman who's like a bodyguard. So he's really just a bit part. Yeah. But he every scene he's in, you're just looking at him going, this guy is going to be somebody huge. You could yeah. just tell. It was way before Soprano. So obviously De Niro is already established, but he takes that back seat. But because he's De Niro, he just shines. He doesn't have to say a word. No. And he doesn't say much. No. He's like the Boba Fett of this movie. He says almost like <laughs> four four <laughs> lines. And he's like, yeah. And he gets stuff. eaten by a giant monster right at the end. <laughs> hey. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. That was kind of a non sequitur. No, I really the thing <laughs> about the De Niro part. If you look at that in the script, I mean, you're talking like yeah. one of the smallest roles in the movie. But the way he manages to just visually steal every scene he's in, even if he's not saying a word, I mean, wow. Well, Bridget Fonda is doing the same exact thing. I mean, they really. She was the blonde, the 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 chick on the beach. The uh, what, what's her name? Lois. Uh, Lewis. Mel- Melanie? Lewis? Melanie. Lewis? Yeah, Lewis. Lewis. The, the one who gets <laughs> shot at the end. <laughs> yeah. Spoilers. Um, she is another person who's like been a leading lady and, and has carried movies. Okay. But she's just playing the part that was written for her, but doing it to the point where she's looking at the words on the paper and she's like, I can do all this shit. All this character, you know, study and whatever, mm-hmm. and just do what's not written to make me who I need to be. And then when the words come out, they mean so much more. Like uh, to me, I mean they te- that's acting 101. If you want to be somebody recognizable, you're going to take whatever's written on that page and just do whatever you need to do physically. Right. While you were talking, I remembered I've seen uh, all the Kill Bill movies too. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, all right. So you are a fan. So there bit. was no way you weren't going to like this movie. <laughs> and yet we still yeah. found one you hadn't even heard of to the point that when we mentioned it two weeks ago, you were just like, oh, okay, Jackie Brown. All right, what's that? Right. We didn't tell you. Now, if we would have said Foxy Brown. Can we watch that next? Them. Foxy Brown? <laughs> that's, my favorite, that's my favorite of the Pam Greer 70s stuff. That yeah. one is good. Also troublesome, but mostly good. Yeah. I, 
what was that with Michael Keaton? Like total caricature. <laughs> like he was what? almost like he was purposely wearing too much makeup. He was over the top. He almost was took his character from other there's a couple other movies where he's very eccentric and very like over animated. He just seemed like he was he was I don't know. He was not Michael Keaton. He was like goofy Michael Keaton, which I I, I liked. He was the one of the ATF guys. I'm like trying to place. I don't even. I I didn't even recognize Ray. Him. His name was Ray. Yeah, I didn't yeah. even recognize him. What? Oh my <laughs> god! His eyebrows. Yeah, it dead like serious. He took a pencil and drew dead, in his eyebrows. That's serious. I it was, was like a cartoon. And when you said his name, I was like, he was in this movie. With the Where? leather jacket and the <laughs> helmet. He's walking around the hallway with a helmet, a leather. I'm like, you're Michael Keaton. Seriously, with the helmet and I the didn't remember, and leather dude, jacket. I mean, yeah. I not that like I would. I guess I don't. I guess I don't know what Michael Keaton's face looks like. <laughs> I've, wow. I know his name. I've heard his name a million times. So he didn't even know Batman was in this. Oh my god! That's but, why you said when it. you said like besides Batman, I'm like, who are you talking about? Who played Batman in this movie? Oh, Chris my Tucker's god. another one. Chris Tucker played a really small part. Oh yeah, you get a young Chris Tucker. Young Chris Tucker, who was wait, what else is Chris Tucker in? Fifth rush Element. Hour, all the Rush Hour movies. Yes, rush hour. yes, he's what, yes, what yes, Hall? yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yep, 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 yep. <laughs> Ruby Rod, Ruby Rod. Yeah, oh, there's man. a lot. Sid Haig is in there. Oh my God, Sid Haig is the judge. Yeah. Oh, he's so good. But George is never going to know who that is because no, no. it's going to take us a while to get to the Big Bird Cage or whatever we're yeah. going to end up watching well, with got, him in it. I'm like looking. I remember Tiny Tiny Listens in there. Oh, who, rest in peace, man. Yeah, we just, just lost died. him. Ugh. So and Forrester. Well, and Robert Forrester. Great, oh oh man, God. have you ever seen Vigilante? <laughs> no. Vigilante is one of his like early '80s movies, and mm-hmm. he he feels old in that too. Like he just never felt young. Like he's not a guy who is like ever baby faced. Right. But, uh, he's like uh, Tommy Lee Jones. He's just got that face. That yeah. He's forty years old. He's like he Ray Liotta. Yeah, Ray Liotta. But imagine like you get Robert Forster, you get Fred Williamson, who's one of my favorite mm-hmm. actors ever, and it's directed by William Lustig, the guy that did Maniac. Like, okay. dude, Vigilante is I'll pretty. Have to check that out. It's it's gross. Yeah, he's but so it's deadpan cool. in this movie, and he's so just, just stoic, and it's, everything about him is just I don't know. He plays it so, so good. I don't think it's a bad performance in this movie. Yeah, his his performance was kind of like, you know how they say like act like you've been there before. Mm-hmm. Well, he has been there. Before. He's been there. Yeah. Oh man, seasoned, seasoned veteran. Yeah, yeah. except for maybe. Maybe the role that he played in this movie, he had never been in that role before. Mm-hmm. But even then, you know, he was acting like right. It w- it was no thing. It was it's funny. I was sitting there the whole time, and I'm wait. I'm waiting for it to be Tarantinoed. <laughs> I've been using that a lot with with Gabe watching. He's watching Walking Dead. And I'm like, oh, they're going to Tarantino. He's like, what do you mean they're going to? I'm like, they're going to go back and they're going to show you everything that just happened mm-hmm. from the different angle or from mm-hmm. this perspective or whatever. And you're like. Why am I three weeks back again? I'm like, oh, they're going to show you this character's point of view of that situation. Yeah, and I normally don't. I really, I normally don't care for that. What? I'm glad that they didn't do a bunch of that. Right. It was, no, they only do a, it once, which is fine. Yeah. In this? Yeah. In this. I yeah. think they do it like once or twice. The ending, the whole ending's that way. But I don't yeah. think throughout the movie they no, do no, it. no, no, they just, just do it just once. The ending. Yeah. You see everyone's point of view of the heist yeah. in the mall, which is cool. I was a little stressed. It's the first time I've seen this movie as well. Wait, yeah, what? Really? In, a, in a long time. I was Man. working at the movie theater when this came out. So I remember watching it with the employees, but I was like projectionist, so I, I was in and out of the theater. I didn't watch, like sit down and watch I watch think it. that you were working in the movie theater that uh, Max Cherry went to in the mall. None. Like that looked like the shirt that you used yeah. to wear that that concession guy. <laughs> well, this was filmed in '97, right? Yeah, you were like working ni- at a movie 96, theater at that point, '96, '97 right? is when they took us out of the bow ties and white shirts and put us in the polos. Yeah, oh, there yeah. you go. Yeah, yeah this so is your era. You man. were working in that. I was movie working. Theater, I mean, yeah. I don't know if it was a United Artists, but that's where I worked. So yeah, no, there's that's a little nostalgia like. there too. Well, cause they didn't, you know, you don't see the sign, but that's what they're. Yeah, that's yeah. So I remember working seeing this movie multiple times 
you know, the ending because mm-hmm. I was cleaning the theater and all that stuff. Like I remember, you know, I was a supervisor then, so I was like in and out of all the theaters, running around, making sure this was done. So I remember watching it, but never sitting down. He and was watching the it. manager. Uh, he was somebody supervisor. important, George. Watch out. I was the assistant to the assistant manager. <laughs> he was the assistant regional manager <laughs> at the local movie theater, right? Yeah. Sorry, that's a reference you haven't gotten yet. No, there, George, it's fine. Nope. But you will. Oh, but you will. Oh, but you will. Oh man, ninety seven's a weird era too. Like this, what else is coming out at this point that is really like still Seven, relevant I think today? Ninety seven. I need like a list of the top. Twister, I think, was ooh. around that time. Sorry, Dave, but ooh. <laughs> my buddy Dave <laughs> I like loves Twister that for movie. It, for what it was. <laughs> uh, yeah, Seven, Twister, Braveheart, I ugh. think came out around that time, 96, yeah. 97. There's a reason this movie's looking back, and it's not just <laughs> it's not just because it's convenient. Well, I mean, Boogie Nights, all right. Yeah, Boogie Nights. But like Titanic, Gross Point Blank. Oh, I love Gross Point Blank. Ugh. Starship Troopers. I mean, there's movies. Starship Troopers. Anaconda. Yeah. Right? There's movies <laughs> coming out that I are still on DVD, you know? Yeah. But Face Off. Like, again, there's a oh reason. Oh, God. Face Off. So there's bad. a reason so this good. movie feels so, like, <laughs> yearning for a pastime. Right. <laughs> oh, man. I mean, as good as it gets, you get the Helen Hunt. Uh, yeah, it's good stuff. I like that movie. Double up with Twister. Scream 2 already. Scream 2. I mean, Fifth Element. Okay, there are movies that are decent. It was a good year. Not great. It wasn't Beverly like Hills 95, Ninja, 94. Beautician and the Beast. I mean, there's some real classic gems here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Men in Black. Okay. All right. Yeah, some of these movies are still good. That was a big summer. I remember that. 97 was a big summer. Bay Bay's Kids. But we uh, we basically showed our hand at the end of the Dirty Harry episode, George, because we had a whole discussion on black exploitation and seventies movies and Pam Greer and Foxy Brown and Coffee and all the movies she was in and how great she was. Mm-hmm. And then we hard transitioned to, and you're going to be watching Jackie Brown, and you're just like, okay, yeah. And I'm like, yeah, we Sounds just described good. exactly <laughs> the context <laughs> of the movie you're watching. You have no idea. Okay, cool, good. And she was so good in this. Oh, Pam Greer is a national treasure. Yeah. My only issue with this movie is a personal issue. All the smoking was just driving me nuts. I Why? I just I just can't stand smoking. So the fact that everybody was smoking, like babies were smoking in this movie. <laughs> they were smoking in public <laughs> in the mall. Yeah, they're like talking to each other. There's the cloud of smoke coming out of their face into that face. And I'm just like, oh, I just... Everything I hated about the nineties. <laughs> yeah. You know, though, I think it was it was used really effectively like the first time uh Jackie Brown is in the ATF office and he says, Did you know, I don't remember me telling you you could smoke in here or whatever and mm-hmm. she's like, Can I smoke? And he was like, No. Like that's important. Yeah. Because later on after, you know, they pull it off or, you know, think they've pulled it off. Like, he's grilling her in the office and she's smoking and she has, like, an ash hanging there. Mm-hmm. And she's like, not cocky at an all. an inch and a half long. Mm-hmm. And, like, you're waiting for it to fall. And, like, it's kind of like a like a really anxious thing to look at. Like a really long ash on the end of a cigarette, right. <laughs> right, isn't it? And that's like the it, feel of that scene. It almost says cops should let suspects smoke because it shows a lot about what's going on in their head sometimes. Like she, if she was, no, had nothing I'm, to worry about, she was would have been more conscious. But she's sitting there listening to what they're saying. Well, at she's that not, point, at that point, she was not like a suspect. They weren't trying to play her anymore. Like, no, but they they did mention that. Uh, Sam Jackson got away. Uh-huh. The money, he kept saying to her, you know, is there anything else you need to tell me? Like, she knew the only way I'm getting out of this is to kill is him. if they get him. If right. they get him, but he can still talk. She didn't know that he knew that, she, you know, what's his name was at the mall. Uh, Max was at the mall. Because that's what gave it away. When De Niro saw Max at the mall, that's, mm-hmm. and he says that to, mm-hmm. uh, is it Del? Del? Like, yeah. Oh, 
What the heck's his name? Ordell. I want to, Ordell. I wanted to say Delroy. Ordell tells him that's when he puts two and two together and realizes right. I got her. I got her. She doesn't know he knows that. She right. just knows that they're going to press her for other money. You know, is there anything else? So then that's when you could tell in her face that she no longer had control of the situation. She was at the mercy of them. Right. But at that point, the cop is like, help me help you. Because the cop doesn't want her. Right. Like, at the time, then when they weren't letting her smoke in the office, they were trying to flip her. Right. Right? And at, at this point, everything's effed up. Right. Right? And they're both kind of in the office figuring out how to fix it or how to, like, I don't know. The feel of the scene... Very tense. ...was the feeling that I get when I see someone's ash <laughs> an inch and a half and they haven't flicked mm-hmm. it and it's about to fall on something. See, I think she had multiple levels of anxiety. That's all, that's all I'm yeah. saying about that, right. like how he used it in the movie. It was great. It was like, perfect. He, I, he definitely did that on purpose. Right, absolutely. Listen, you're going to act the scene with your ash like an inch and mm-hmm. a half long on your cigarette. Mm-hmm. Like, because you're stressed out and you're not paying attention to so it. Do you, like, I, I guess we all read it differently. Like I read it as she was anxious about Sam Jackson's character hunting her down. Mm-hmm. She was anxious about uh, how she was going to get out of this now that everything got effed up. Mm-hmm. But she was also anxious about the fact that she she hid that $450,000 from the ATF. Mm-hmm. And if she continues to play this game, they're going to find out about that. Mm-hmm. So that played in there. Like She was on many levels anxious. Yes. She's, she's got a real like uh, Janet Lee thing going on there yeah. where it's just Janet Lee getting pulled over by the highway patrolman. Yep. You know, it's yep. that same exact tension. Hmm. And she just plays it to a T. I mean, her acting in the final shot, you know, driving mm-hmm. off in, well, into camera, essentially. And like, mm-hmm. you know, the, the look... You know, it's one thing to be able to project with your your facial expression, but then the way she kind of warms up to singing along with Across 110th Street, but, like, sad? Oh, man. Like, right in the feels, guys. Now, would the sequel be him meeting up with her? You think he would ever go to to Mexico with her? Or Spain? There will never be a sequel. I know, but I mean, like, character-wise, like... Like we're we're always taught, what were you doing five minutes prior to your scene? What were you? What are you going to be doing ten minutes after your scene? It kind of helps you develop your character. I imagine like, she gets in trouble and he has to save her again, or he gets in trouble, reaches out to her because, you know, he knows he can trust her, but he can't trust whoever's around him. Right. I was just trying to figure out, like, when he said, "Can I call you back in a half?" Hour, or "Call me back in a half hour?" Like, what was going through his head? Was he thinking, "I want to leave this job and go with her"? Or am I going to see her again because she might need my help again? Like all these things were going on in that face. You got to leave that say cat. A word. You got to leave that cat in the box, man. We don't want to yeah. know. Okay, it's too good to try to pick one. Because they're such good characters, I could see a trilogy easily. No, 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 no. Quentin Tarantino appreciates a story too much to ruin it with money, and that's why he's so good. All right, here you go. Kill Bill too. <coughs> Kill what Bill it? too. If there's more story to tell, you can do it as long as you're mm-hmm. writing it yourself nope. and other people aren't. Yeah, but Kill Bill Two nope. is like the beginning and end of the story. Like that's all one story. Just it, you can't have a six-hour movie. They yeah, won't it's like let you. Lord of the Rings. <laughs> it's like <laughs> it's one full. St- that's what I'm saying. Like don't keep making yeah. sequels to make money. If there's enough character there that you could have a big story. No, you could. Nope. You don't want it. I don't. You want could it. have it. You could have it. <laughs> I mean, if you had to do it, I mean, if you're going to twist my arm, I would probably... I see the prequel of De Niro. <laughs> what I want to see, yeah, I want to see it Not as that, like I a... Say. I want to see a universe, right? Yes. I don't want to see like Jackie Brown 2 and Jackie Brown 3, but if you have like a right. Chasing Amy in there and a Dogma in the same mm-hmm. universe as your clerks, like, okay, yeah, no, let's do that. Absolutely. That's uh, pretty cool. Actually. I'm down. Lewis. Do a movie about Lewis. I want to see why he was in jail. He did a bank robbery. See, yeah, but I want to see that bank robbery. I want to see who he went into that bank robbery with. I want to see his interaction with them. I want to see his rise and fall. I want to, I see, want to see it all. Who he shot on the way out. I mean, and if <laughs> you want to have, uh, <laughs> if you want to have <laughs> character <laughs> development, here's what you do. Right, uh, as we're writing the prequel, you've got to have Lewis 
miss somebody in the lobby that should tip him off that it's a bad idea. So right. that when he notices Absolutely. Max in this movie, that's his moment of growth. But you can definitely do like a Marty McFly, don't call me chicken thing, where he definitely blasts somebody for talking too much in the prequel right. too. Like that's just got to be a character <laughs> thing for him. You push him too yeah. far, he's going to shoot you in the heart. Like yep. normally you just say to somebody, just shut up, man. No, he just will shoot you. <laughs> I love how You're dead. I love how Samuel L. Jackson was like, you couldn't have just hit her? Like, <laughs> Yeah, I guess I could have. I mean, but, I could have, you know, but... You know, she just wouldn't <laughs> shut up. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> She's breaking my balls. <laughs> yeah. And somewhere Ray Liotta has to be in there somewhere. Because he's good. I agree. Mm. Quentin, if you're listening, we need a prequel. We're going to have De Niro dies. de-age De Niro <laughs> like a Mandalorian you know, like the, type thing. The Irishman, yeah. <laughs> oh, I still haven't watched The Irishman. Sorry, Troy. Uh, although, Troy, talking about it definitely made me think I need to watch it. Yeah, I've heard both. I've heard it's boring. I've heard it's awesome. So I mean, people I said this movie was boring. Hold on a second. Guys, when this movie came out, people said it was boring. <laughs> What the? Well, they're watching Twister. I, yeah, I mean, that's true. No cows went flying through the air yeah. in this one. I mean, nobody nobody wants to sit and watch dialogue. They want to actually see cows flying by. Oh, my God. We've I got cows. Yeah. I love the dialogue. Yeah? It's all this, this, this whole movie is dialogue. That's what I like about his movies. Like, yeah. they could be plays. You know, mm-hmm. they're just like, it's just human interaction. Like, it, for, it, two, for two hours or whatever. Like, just human interaction. And it's... It's beautiful, dude. Well, that's what makes Pulp Fiction so good. Like, yeah. you don't need any action in that movie at all. No, nope. you could just have two guys sitting in a car talking to each other for twenty minutes, and it's Oscar award winning. Yeah, he does write good dialogue. And the camera angles, mm-hmm. the work, like the camera work. There's, there was a couple shots where, I was just, I was thinking like this dude, like from the, from the first, the first scene or the first shot, like. Her walking. She's not walking. Mm-hmm. She's on a moving sidewalk. Right. You see the wall going behind her, and so she and she's a flight attendant. Like she's obviously on a moving sidewalk. She's obviously in an airport. He told this like whole story with just like that, mm-hmm. right? That's not like brilliant or anything, but you know. Then there was other shots. It just like, draws you in when she like was when she was looking for the cops in the mall and she couldn't find them. Mm-hmm. Right? They weren't where they were and supposed to be. Dull, and that that was shot. like a like a steady cam through the entire mall. It was one shot. It went all the way around her. Like it's beautiful. Mm-hmm. Well, in that shot when Beaumont is about to get killed, spoiler alert. Yes, for the first twenty from, minutes of the movie. <laughs> from, yes, from the trunk. Well, yeah. the the shot before that when he's you know he's parked, and the camera swings along with the headlights. You're like, oh, that's nice. You got yeah. camera movement, and the car drives and it kind of centers up again. You're like, yeah, this is nice. Okay, we're shooting coverage. Okay. Oh, the signal's on. All right, well, we're turning. This is cool. We're going to cut to a new A. Oh, we're not cutting. Oh, we're lifting. Oh, oh, shit. He's going to kill that guy. Right. Like, <laughs> Here, mm-hmm. hold this gun. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I'm not getting that dirty truck. <laughs> yeah. I didn't see it coming. I love I the whole conversation of him trying to convince him to get in the trunk mm-hmm. from the view of the trunk. Oh, yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. It's br- brilliant. Well, yeah. and the camera shot at the end from the view of uh, Ordell dead on the floor looking yes. up at Batman and, and Foxy Brown. <laughs> mm-hmm. I like Pam Greer enough that I shouldn't call her Foxy Brown. She's a hell, right. hell of an actress in everything she's been in. Uh, but Michael Keaton is Batman. So yes. he gets he gets that label. Although and actually, he kind of looks like his character in uh, like Multiplicity. Like what? He's just he's such a caricature in his movie. And that's the thing with his... like George needs to know that after Batman... Michael Keaton kind of has like an identity crisis. Like, is he tough guy? Is he funny guy? He can't really mm. get back to as funny as he, funny as he was before Batman. He's not you getting look at the him roles. Like desperate measures. He can play that character. He could play that badass, you know, angry person. I have that problem sometimes too. Yeah. You come yeah off am, I the, am I the tough guy or am I the funny guy? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just but, that's funny. But then he was in Jack Frost, and it all kind of fell off the rails. Yeah. No, that's not good. But, but then, you know, you look at him in like Desperate Measures. That's where he plays a serial killer, right? I've never seen Desperate uh, Measures, man. Okay, yeah, he, it's him and Andy Garcia, and he plays like a serial killer, kind of like a Hannibal Lecter, you know, being moved. Oh, Brian Cox I, is in that movie, the yeah, other Hannibal Lecter. Wow, that's weird. He's got to get like a operation or something, so they they bring him in like high security uh, into a hospital, and then he escapes, and then stuff ensues. But yeah, he plays a badass in that movie, so he can do it. Huh. But he didn't do it in this movie. 
Huh. Speaking of Hannibal Lecter, have you guys watched Hannibal the series on like Netflix? I have not. I've seen some of the ep- the like the first season, and then I lost the the uh, free trial and stopped watching. Oh, you should get the should you it. should get the not free trial. No, I have it now. I should probably start watching it. Yeah, I just like want to know what your opinions of the the Lecter in that uh, series is. I'll do that, and you watch Bates Motel, and then we'll have a we'll have a full. Mm. Ooh, this sounds like yeah, Patreon content. Yeah, yeah, let's do that. Because that, that plays really well into your love of a psycho, I think. Mm-hmm. We'll do that shit. Sounds good. Psycho's cool. pretty good, guys. Yeah, it's up there. It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of influential. Man. Hmm. I love this movie. I love this movie. I love this movie because it is not influential. Instead, mm. it is just like the sum total of all the best things from movies made between like 1970 and 1980 but then also a new theme that you could only do if you had the actors from 20 years ago Mm. yeah it kind of has like that Ocean's Eleven feel in the writing and the storytelling and the complexity of the of the heist and all that stuff and then you get the 70s exploitation type feel which is nice and then you get all these great actors. It's just a lot of feels, a lot of nostalgic feels in this movie. Yeah, I don't have any complaints about this movie at all. Like, she was one of my first crushes. Not Pam Greer, but, like, Bridget Fonda. And to see her kind of in this part was pretty sweet. Pam Greer is one of my current crushes. What's up? Oh, nice, nice. Whoa. (laughs) Man. (laughs) Hey, now. Her in that red dress. I do have to say, when she walked into, when she wanted to give uh, uh, Ordell... Uh, a what's for out on the back deck. She walked into his house in that red dress. I was like, mm. damn. Damn. <laughs> well, and that's a reference to uh, one of her key outfits in Foxy Brown. Okay. That's like a visual reference, although it's not nearly as scandalous, maybe, mm-hmm. as it was in, in Foxy Brown. But she is now 44 or whatever they say. Now? In the movie, she's 40. like in that movie, she's 44, she's forty four yeah. in that movie. Her character is forty four in that movie, and and that's all right. I met her once at a convention. Oh, really? Yeah, it was like a brief meeting because I didn't wait in line for her, but she was walking by, so I shook her hand. That's pretty I cool. Said, hey, yeah, it was same time I met Michael Bean, which is a weird show. <laughs> that is a fun mix. I think I knew it at the time. She was uh, she was in Mars Attacks, I think. So she was kind of pushing that, so she was kind of out on the uh, circuit. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. The scene right after she gets dropped off by Max Cherry. Oh, my God. She is so tough in that scene. She's a bad lady. Oh, she has the two guns? That. One against his dick? (laughs) That (laughs) scene, (laughs) like, for me, was like, damn. Mm Mm-hmm. You know what was cool about that scene? He kept turning the lights down. Hmm. Right? And she kept turning them back up and he kept turning them back down. And so when the confrontation happened (laughs) (laughs) and he had to ask because he couldn't see. (laughs) Uh, That's good stuff. And he was legitimately, uh, she was completely in control. It was the first time I ever saw him kind of on the defensive. Uh huh. Because he knows her. He knows her. He knows what she's capable of. Uh huh. Even though he had his Jalo killer gloves on, he was. Uh huh. <laughs> he was ready, but yeah, he we, wasn't that ready. Can we talk about the elephant in the room? What's that? Because I already know Sam Jackson's thing is uh, in every movie he's in. He said his the way he gets the character he's going to play is through the hair. So okay. he, he does something different with his hair in every movie he's in. Okay. And if if you know that, you'll see in his movies, like, he does crazy shit with his hair. Okay. This was m- probably the craziest. <laughs> that <laughs> He looked like he was smuggling a horse underneath that hat. Like, it was just ridiculous. Yeah. Well, that and he had that, that little beard. Yeah, his little, little quarantine beard. doesn't want to shave, any, shave any more beard. Oh, All man. braided out. Ooh. But then at the end, like, I don't know. It, I just, that was the worst. And what's funny is you can go and look at every movie and the things he's done with his hair 
is ridiculous, but that was that was the worst. I couldn't get past it. Yeah, but I mean, he he had that silly hair on when he was sitting on the couch t- talking about all the guns. <laughs> so I mean, I have to forgive some of that. And then he took it down, like at the end when he, it's it's out of the ponytail. <laughs> like, yeah, God. <laughs> he looks like looks like the Crip Keeper. <laughs> But how did you like uh, a little Die Hard connection? Uh, the featured prominent role of the Styrog while he's sitting on the couch talking about guns. Did you guys catch that? That's the gun that the the, uh, the Austrian oh, brother oh, the chicks in the in the bikinis and guns. Yeah, yeah. When, yeah. when part he's five, talking about the actual gun. When part three or part five, Jason, whatever, we decided that Austrian <laughs> bad guy in Die Hard was who'd mm. been hung and then appears at the end. He he had a Styrog the whole time. And okay. so now you've got a Styrog in here, and uh, Counter Strike fans know what's up. B two four, <laughs> that's right. Hey, this is Dan in post. It looks like it's actually B four four, but I haven't played CS in like ten years, so sorry. Now she mentioned Demi Moore. Was she one of the bikini chicks? I, that's what I. That's what no, she it was just a brunette with the same. Oh, okay, build. I was gonna say yeah. that's a good Bruce Willis connection there too, because <laughs> <laughs> at the time I think they were still together. And then, of course, the speech about the AK-47. Mm. Mm. Oh, man. This is a cool the movie. Entire, the entire beginning, like, that whole conversation was just, like, Sam Jackson talking. like, yeah. And De Niro not talking. And I would, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I could listen to him talk for, like, yeah. two hours. If the, whole, if the whole movie was just him talking, that would be fine. Did you know he it's was okay. the dad on Ghost Rider? That old PBS show. Who? Sam Jackson? Sam Jackson. No, I didn't We know were that. watching that on YouTube the other day with the kids because there's a new one on Apple TV, but it's not nearly as cool. So we were watching the old ones, and yeah, episode one, Jamal's dad, Sam Jackson. Hmm. Nice. I what a varied career. Oh, I remember yeah. that show, though. He also shows up in Exorcist 3 in like an Does uncredited he? part, which is just, I mean, yeah, man. Is that before he was in Coming to America? I don't I know, think so. That was his so. film debut, like his like credited film debut was Coming to America. No, because uh, Exorcist 3 is the early 90s. Okay. It's like 91, 92, 93, somewhere in there. All right, so Coming to America was like 87, 88, right? Something like that. Coming to America was 88, yeah. I found it funny the way like Melanie just like shits on Sam Jackson's yeah. character. <laughs> Which is funny time. because the, they establish in the beginning the, the first time you meet them is that he's in control of her, but right? Then you figure out she's just she's just fucking <laughs> like uh, she's <laughs> she's humoring him basically. Yeah, basically. <laughs> I I love how she shits on him. Like it's so funny to me when she talks about like when he's not there and she's talking about like he doesn't know anything about guns. He's just like repeating. Right, <laughs> like things that he's heard from other things, blah blah blah, blah. and I'm like, yo, I thought that when he was talking, like when he was talking about like every every motherfucker wants a 45, and he don't want one, he wants two, blah blah, blah. and it's like, and he's like, and I got my blah blah, blah. it was like he was talking about something like nine millimeter, it was like it's like basically the same thing, blah blah, blah. and I'm like, no, it's no, not. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like this guy doesn't know and and I thought I was like yeah that's like really sloppy of Tarantino to put that line in there and like he did it for a reason, for a reason. the payoff was Melanie shitting on him later mm. I was like this th- it's just this movie's great dude George turned his phone off <laughs> so I'm gonna show I guess this is uh, Foxy Brown oh wow yeah man that's check a, her out that's a whole lot of women yeah Damn. No, it's not. Let me see again. Damn. She's hot. She looks good. I think she looks better in the in this. I mean, yeah, she's not showing any skin, but I mean, in her face, she aged very well. Is that a current picture of her? No, this no, is like from, from 74-ish? 70, when did this movie come out? Yeah, Boxing 74, around. 76, somewhere in there. I think she looks better in... And in this movie, in it was this 97? Movie yeah. Holy crap. Yeah, she's like... She's uh, 20 years older in this movie mm-hmm. than that picture? She's like Raquel Welsh. Well, and that's part of the Does thing. Does she have I Benjamin mean, Button disease or something? I need to leave some <laughs> kind of like gap here because I need to cut out some of this drooling over Pam Greer. <laughs> no, you don't. No, you don't. Her, uh, she, she's a babe, dude. Um, 
<laughs> She's a Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, callback. Episode three, four, three. But uh, <laughs> I haven't heard your Garth in a while, dude. Yeah, just came out. Yeah. <laughs> you see her dress up like a girl bunny. <laughs> nice. Dan's trying to get a pause, but like we keep giving him material. <laughs> <laughs> but that's part of the whole point of the movie, right? Is you know, her high point, her like her peak era is the 70s and everything since then has been a steady downhill decline in her personal life, the character, but also Pam Greer's acting career after Mm -hmm. the 70s. She does stuff in the 80s, but it's not as notable as it was in the 70s. Uh, Forrester, really, after Vigilante, he does some stuff, but like, you know, he's not a household name until this movie and after this movie, he's in all kinds of stuff. Worked a lot recently. Yeah, but this whole idea of just how do you deal with your own aging? How do you deal with the fact that the world has kind of passed you by, not unlike no country, I guess. Mm. But, you know, Very how do you like handle that. and how do you deal with a world that's already starting to pass you by? And it's just, you know, even down to their choice of media, you know, this whole discussion of, well, I'm too old. I've put too much money into start over with a CD collection, so I still listen mm-hmm. to my albums. And then even though he calls her out for not having CDs, you notice he buys a cassette tape. <laughs> cassette tape, yeah. Yeah. In his, like, dad khakis and <laughs> the silliest dad sweater like his outfit in the mall is just he's perfectly out of touch with the style yeah because he's yep. old and he's fine with it and it's beautiful it is beautiful i was i was uh i was enjoying that little narrative because I, I i didn't catch that at first now that you're talking about it it's uh definitely adds layers that's funny i can relate to that a little bit because, like, some of the guys that I work with at uh, at Guitar Center, they're like, dude, you look like a dad. And I'm like, oh, is it what I'm wearing? And they're like, kind of. It's like the fact that you don't care what you look like. <laughs> 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 Fuck you. <laughs> Good thing this is an audio show. Yeah, right? I post a picture of my visor on the group. You've got a visor? <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, dude, I wear a visor. <laughs> Oh, shoot. All you need is the khakis, and you're like three quarters of the way to Jim Harbaugh. Ugh. I was, yeah, well, I was thinking Sean Payton, but yeah, basically. Well, you're I, then I'm you're. Bald. I'm bald, so I can't wear a visor. Need some, uh, that would look stupid. Juicy <laughs> fruit. Get George some juicy fruit, and he's Sean Payton. Yep. Ugh. Yeah, if I wore a visor, it would be uh, pointless. I don't think I wore a visor when I had a full head of hair. Well, you didn't have kids my... at the time. This is true. You weren't a dad. That's true. Although I'm a dad and I don't wear visors because I have some self respect. <laughs> My thing is I <laughs> wear shorts even when it's cold out. <laughs> yeah. It's like, what's wrong with that guy? There's one no, of those in every group. It. If if yeah. you don't realize it, you look down, you're wearing shorts. <laughs> yeah. Cargo shorts, <laughs> which makes it worse. <laughs> totally dates me. It's like, I got pockets in my pockets. I mean, sometimes you got stuff in those pockets that people are like, man, I wish I had pockets so I could have that stuff. <laughs> yeah, everybody always asks me to hold shit for them. That's why, because I got pockets in my pockets. Oh, what's that? Wife, you want me to hold your phone? Okay, only put it in the <laughs> extra pocket for the other phone. Oh, kids, you need me to hold that Game Boy? All right, I got pockets for that. Yeah. Who needs a diaper bag? I can fit diapers yeah, and wipes you in guys are You guys are speaking <laughs> my language, dude. Like, at my at my other job, like my full-time job i have like a hat that like has a pencil holder in it nice because i often need a pencil didn't the yeah. lord give you an ear george ear. i'm pretty sure you're supposed to keep it in your well, ear that's what i used well, if you're to wearing do. a hat you could just jam the i used pencil to just the shove ear. it up yeah. yeah i used to shove it up that's in, what i do playing golf hat. but hmm. now it's in the little pocket that's on my hat that's nice i have like this like you know how like does your hat say world's greatest dad <laughs> no, it's like, it's blank. It's just like tan color. Okay. You know how like people that work in a trade like wear a belt, like a tool belt? Yeah. Right? Okay. They like pull your pants down. Yes. Oh, it sucks. The world is aware. 
Well, it's because when you hit 35, you have no more ass. <laughs> so everything well, slides down the back. I think even if you had an ass, your tools would just <laughs> pull your pants down. Right. Right? So I have this, like, tool belt. I guess it's not really a belt. It goes over your shoulder and, like, so a it cross... It's like you a, a crossbody. <laughs> no, it's like a crossbody tool bag. Okay. Whatever. That's what people like, call me when they're, like, insulting me. You <laughs> <laughs> crossbody tool bag? Hey, crossbody tool bag. But, like, I'm up on a ladder, and my tools are on my shoulder, and my pants are around my hips. Nice. But your socks are showing. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm wearing white New Balance. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Oh, man. But it's functional, man. It's functional. So, yeah, if you ever get threatened with a credit card, George, watch but. Plus, thinking skateboarding. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I won't because I have a crossbody tool bag. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure your uh, coworkers call you a crossbody tool bag when you're I, not around. I think I'm going to be making the remedial <laughs> film class podcast T-shirt that says crossbody tool bag. Oh, you should my just God. make a T-shirt with the tool bag on it. On it. <laughs> And it's, it goes goes across your shoulder. Right. It's like a strap across your body, like a seatbelt. But on the like side of the sh- on the side of the shirt is like a tool bag right. with like tools. And so it's like a Chewbacca well, T-shirt. I think but we for said us. before. Yes. You know the knowledge we're making you learn watching these movies. It's like tools in your toolbox. Well, we could just put mm-hmm. it to tools in your crossbody tool bag, and so you could have one pouch <laughs> that's like you know slasher movies, and one pouch that's right. like action movies. And, yeah, get to work, Travis. That's a good idea. We're going to do the Chewbacca t-shirt with different pouches. <laughs> yeah, essentially. Yeah. And maybe like some, uh, you know, make it look a little bit like a 60s bat utility belt. Right. <laughs> <laughs> with, our lo- with our logo on the belt buckle. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> this idea writes itself. Do that. <sighs> good shit. So we get into like the filmmaking part of this movie, or we just continue to gush over silliness? No, talk about I don't know. here. Just uh, give it a clean second, and then you bring us in, man. It's all you now. I don't know what to say. I just like George's comments. Um, I can comment more. Yeah, comment more because if you like. I enjoy your insight when it comes to filmmaking. Because you say things, you don't realize that that's like you do realize it, and then but you don't realize it in other movies, which is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> It's true. You're educated. You, you are Tarantino educated, and then yeah. you're still learning shit, which is pretty funny. Isn't that that is funny though? It is funny. It's like saying, "Oh, I'm a Hitchcock fan," but you're still learning shit from us. <laughs> 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 like seriously? Oh man, you should know everything by just watching his movies. Yeah, it's it, probably a lot of stuff in the movies that I've seen of his went over my head because I haven't yeah. seen. Lots of anything else. Yeah, because he was... I'm sure Dan would be able to tell us who Tarantino's influences are. Oh, man. Tarantino, uh, very well-versed in all of the exploitation movies of the 70s. And so you've got mm. you know, your uh, quote-unquote black exploitation with uh, a lot of Pam Greer and Fred Williamson and a bunch of other actors. Uh, you've got your straight-up like murdery exploitation movies like Your Last House is on the Left and such, mm-hmm. and the smaller productions like The Candy Snatchers and stuff like that. Um, that's a good one if you like gross movies. It's 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 good. I like that one. Yeah, because you said you... Was it Death Race? Or what was the one you used? The death Proof? Death Proof, that's right. Oh, Which yeah. And he the, has Death Race in, in it. In all, in all fairness, I probably wouldn't have seen that movie except for... like. I had seen a bunch of Tarantino movies and I liked Tarantino and someone that I used to work with, uh, Lindsay, shout out to Lindsay if she's listening, said it that was her favorite movie. Mm. She's like, have you ever seen that? That's a Tarantino movie. And I was like, no, never even heard of it. And that's why I watched it. It's funny. That that's probably your introduction to Kurt Russell is that movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's done funny. like 30 movies before that and like 900 TV shows. Yeah, but that's your Kurt Russell. That's going to be your Kurt Russell. Yeah, well, and then a you'll lot be of shocked people, every time you see him elsewhere. A lot yeah. of people didn't really get Death Proof. Like they looked at it as, oh, this is Tarantino, but it's not what I expect from a Tarantino. Kind of mm. like I think Jackie Brown's initial theatrical response. Death Proof got a lot of that too, and especially if you did, you see it as the Grindhouse feature, George. Yeah. Did you watch both movies or just Death Proof? I I don't remember. The Grindhouse was with Rose McGowan, right? 
She was the other part, or no? That was that was the death. Yeah, no. Was, Planet was Terror that. is the first half of Grindhouse. Right. Grindhouse was a two movie with fake trailers in between and at the beginning, uh, theatrical experience back in like mm. 06 uh, or okay. so. And so, George, the Planet Terror movie is kind of a zombie movie, and it's got our guy from No Country. It's got Rose McGowan. It's got a bunch of folks. Uh, right. She gets a machine gun for a leg at one point. Did you see this movie? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> You'd remember so. the machine gun for the leg, I would hope. I don't. Th- I don't think yeah. I've seen it. It's okay. Uh, it's a splatter fest, and it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, but to follow that with maybe the high point of 2000 cinema for me, which was the Thanksgiving trailer made by Eli Roth. I mean, mm. that's. I need that movie in my life, Eli Roth. Come on, man. Uh, and then to follow it with Death Proof, that is so talky. And so just a small budget movie made by uh, Roger Corman and Jack Hill or somebody in the early 70s, mm. right? There's a bunch of movies like that. A lot of them are real real good if you know what you're getting into. But for the mainstream audience, they, they didn't really play in the 70s. They'd only play at drive-ins. And so it's just really interesting that that's your first Tarantino because that's like to a lot of people the least... Tarantino, mm. but I would say it's maybe the most Tarantino up until Once Upon a Time in Hollywood because it is so much what he would have been watching in the 70s just directly brought to a new group rather than like his standard style of mixing a bunch of different forms and, and a bunch of different influences. It's pretty like single influence. Is well, that wasn't that wasn't my first Tarantino though. What was it? Pulp Get Fiction? your story straight, George. No, no, no. I said I wouldn't. That was... What I was saying was Death Proof is like a more obscure one, you know. It's a, it's a more obscure one of Tarantino's movies. So is this when we get Dan from Post where he makes fun of me that Kurt Russell's not in Death Proof? <laughs> no, Kurt Russell is definitely the driver of the Death Proof car. Okay. For sure. No, you're good. No, what I was saying was I was into Tarantino. I had seen, I think, Reservoir Dogs. I had seen Pulp Fiction. Right. I had seen Kill Bill and... Like I love Tarantino, and it was around the time I think that Inglorious Bastards came out, and that's when I was having this conversation with Lindsay, who said, "Have you ever seen Death Proof?" Right. And I was like, "No, I've never heard of it." And she's like, "It's my favorite movie." See, none and of those Tarantino. movies really have that. Like Dan saying, they don't have that time period, like that period piece where it's it's a movie he's homaging that he grew up watching. Gotcha. So, I don't know if Pulp Fiction is one of those movies. It doesn't really homage anything. It kind of just sets a tone. But definitely the Death Race, and uh, not Death Race, death, death Proof and the Splatter film, they're definitely like 70s movies. Like when gotcha. you say it, it's just completely 70s Splatterhouse stuff. Gotcha. Yeah, it's the same kind of stuff that would play in a you know multi-film bill with stuff like A Bay of Blood, Last House on the Left mm-hmm. Part 2 sometimes, you know, Uh Best Friends is one that I'm thinking of that came out recently that's just kind of, you know, four people in the desert moving down the highway. Texas Chainsaw Mm. Massacre. You know, these Mm kind of things where it's just uh, low budget, mostly right off the road kind of movies because it's cheap to film outside. Drive-in type shit. Drive-in in in the desert because there's not as much traffic so you don't have to stop traffic. Uh, That's like a whole movement in the early 70s. And so he's just taking you back then and just adding in elements of like Death Race and other things to kind of, you know, build a build a new beast, but definitely rooted in that era. Hmm. I kind of want him to watch. uh, I know From Dust to Dawn is a Rodriguez movie. Oh, he's watching that movie. But you're definitely. Oh, he's watching the hell out of that movie. Definitely has a Tarantino feel to it that you, you have to see once we get to the vampire type oh my movies. god we'll be watching the shit out of that movie oh my Word. god oh man i don't want to bias him but he better yeah. fucking like that movie <laughs> 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 that's the kind of movie that and starship troopers were both of those movies we actually after we were done watching them we went upstairs re-threaded it and watched it again like it was just like we don't care the sun's coming up we're gonna watch this again good shit yeah, Starship Troopers is fun. It's not one it's of my favorites. Movie. I think right. if I watched it more often, it would quickly become one because it is just, it is purely what it wants to be. Mm-hmm. And it's about it's as like close Robocop. to Robocop it's as satirical. you get. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
get out of my head thinking the same thing at the same moment. Yeah, it's as close <laughs> to RoboCop as you get. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, without. But better because the effects are better. The money's there. Wait. There's a hu- huge cast. I don't know, there's no uh, red foreman yeah. saying guns, 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 yeah. guns. Yeah. No, there's guns. plenty of other. It's it's more of like a military satire satire movie. Well, and Ironsides is so good. Yeah, it's good. It's worth watching. It's a little dated, but it's worth. It's way better than the sequels too. It's the original. Oh, they did sequels. Ew. I think they did t- one or two. Ew. I don't like sequels, man. The more I think about it, the more I live through them. We don't need sequels unless it's a Jason movie or a Batman movie. Or an alien movie. Or an alien movie. Or a Predator movie for about a half hour. <laughs> <laughs> Depending on who makes the sequel, Predator. Oh, man. This this whole sequel thing or the multi-part movie thing, it just like, I don't know. It just has to be a good story, mm-hmm. you know? It can't just be a cash cow. That's the problem. Is Same with the remakes. If there's a reason why you have to do it, fine. But don't just make it because you don't want to lose the rights, and then you just redo the movie or okay. remake it. Yeah, same. Yeah, same deal. I I feel like a lot of movies are like just they're sequeled because the first one did so good. Mm-hmm. Let's make more money off of this. And franchise. then they take everything that worked well in the first one and they exaggerate it, and it's just the same movie. Yeah. Yeah, I hate that. Give me a good story. I'll watch ten of them. I mean, they can't all be Home Alone too, guys. Sometimes they have to repeat <laughs> something from the first movie. <laughs> doesn't it <laughs> uh, I heard somebody was complaining about the fact that they were gonna remake Home Alone and they were complaining cause it's like it's sacrilegious to the original I'm like isn't part 3 and 4 sacrilegious to the original and don't I forget mean, part seriously? 5 I mean yeah I mean they're pretty bad One one's great 2 is a repeat and then the rest just are terrible so yeah Stop yeah. making them. <laughs> yeah. Make more uh, Jackie Brown movies. I agree. <laughs> no. Not unless Tarantino's got. Where's I'm going to get you, sucker? Part two. That's my question. Unless Tarantino already has a great story in his head to tell. I want him to do a Lucas version of this movie, just throw in a shit ton of extras and <laughs> CGI. <laughs> That would make a good short. Yeah. Not a whole movie, just like a short. I didn't watch any of the deleted scenes. I'm going to have to check them out later. Oh, there's deleted scenes? I don't even think to look. Uh, With with Tarantino and Christopher Nolan and and directors like that of that ilk, I just always assumed they wouldn't show us if they had them, you know? Mm. So I don't even bother to look. Hmm. Yeah, they got me. I'm curious. I bet you're not going to find a lot of alternate endings in Quentin Tarantino movies, you know? Uh Unless it's part of some kind of narrative function he's come up with to tell you multiple endings or something. But hmm. Speaking of that, like we were talking about the De Niro character. He does that a lot, uh, Tarantino. What? Because in Pulp Fiction, he takes somebody who's iconic, Harvey Keitel, and just turns him into this little bit part. He's like this, he's the cleaner, and he comes in and he does whatever, but oh, he's yeah. like such a small part. But he's Harvey fucking Keitel. Like, that's Robert freaking De Niro, and he's like playing a mute, basically a dumb mute. <laughs> I, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if he does that in other movies, but just to get an icon to come stop by, and it's almost like he's flexing. Yeah. Ugh. So good. Like I'm, s- I'm such a great director. I can get Robert De Niro to <laughs> come play a five minutes in my movie. It's almost like he sends out an email and says, listen, I'm making this movie. You guys stop by, find a part for you. <laughs> <laughs> and they just do their thing and it and becomes Oscar Everybody award says yes. Ugh. Everyone's like, all right. Yeah, I'll be there. Oh, you want me to play bodyguard? Okay, fine. I'll do that. Okay. It's fun. When he pulled his gun out and shot her, I was like, wait, what? We, what? <laughs> that ruins the whole thing, you <laughs> asshole. And then I get it because he's just like, she wouldn't shut up. Well, and that's one thing that uh, we should address. <laughs> you were talking about Ocean's Eleven and these, you know, these heist movies where everything goes off like clockwork, and you get four or five different shots at the same time in a multi-angle thing, and you get to see all the little tick-tock, tick-tock movements as they all click together, and oh, they get away with it. And this one, it just goes into a total like clusterfuck, like mm. big time. 
And it it's ugly and it's messy and maybe at first you're like, ooh, messy. It's very much like real life. But it is so mm. yeah. Just a chance to see people react in the moment. Mm. Well that happens in pulp fiction too. Like when when they shoot that guy in the head by accident in the back mm-hmm. seat. Like that changes the whole story. Yep. That <laughs> little mistake. Let's take a hard right. Yeah. It's like now all this shit has to happen because you hit a bump. <laughs> yeah. Love that. Royale with cheese. Oh, and then the Tim Roth character, too. Like the, Every movie he makes does that. There's just these little things that totally changes everything. Everybody's in control until they're not. That's the kind of movie I like. Because like you said, some things are on the nose. Some things are foreseeable. But when real life happens, it's almost like it makes what you're watching almost like you're a voyeur. You're watching real shit going down. Mm-hmm. Like it comes. I, I'm gonna repeat myself, but it comes back to that camera shot of her in the mall in the middle of the court, and she can't mm-hmm. find the cops, and she's like, "Oh shit!" And you and I'm thinking, watching this camera shot, like, "What is she thinking? What is she looking for? What is she doing?" Like, I, I thought I'm she like, was looking for the Max character. I'm a hundred percent invested. Well, yeah, me too. But like, I didn't. I didn't know what she was looking for. Mm-hmm. I was like postulating, "What is she looking for?" But she's definitely worried something's not going right mm-hmm. or she's acting like something's not going right i'm not sure maybe she's putting on a performance for the cops who are watching her really sure yeah like yeah. all these things are going <laughs> through my mind in that one camera shot and it's just like dan clarity was she acting or no, was she it frantic? doesn't it doesn't matter it does he, he didn't it's just like the what happens after the thing it doesn't you don't want to pin it down to a specific answer it is better left as Interpretation, it is, man. Okay. Right. You don't even have to interpret it. You can just acknowledge how great it is without having to pin it down to one thing or the other. It's so right. good. So good. Well, you know me. I always want to know what their motivation is, what they were thinking, what what does this mean, what does that look mean. Yeah. And if it could mean whatever I want it to mean, that's fine. I'll take it. Take that home. It's it. a fun kind of uh, performance because if – a couple people can come to different conclusions about the performance that makes it fun to talk about. Mm-hmm. And it brings me full circle back to Clerks. Because I think about a movie like Clerks with the writing that it has, and it's, a, it's an amazing script. If you had that kind of care going into some of those lines, maybe people would be sitting there going, what was Dante thinking? What what did that scene mean? Mm. He said this, but he meant this. I'm not really sure. Like That's all actor talk. Like, I want to know, that line means yes, but what was he saying with that yes? So what you're saying is Tarantino needs to remake Clerks. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. It's either going to be him or me. That's <laughs> <laughs> right, Kevin. I'm there's your, for your, there's your Lewis movie right there. Uh, Lewis running the video yeah. store? He wasn't <laughs> even yeah. supposed to be there Just that a bunch day. of characters. And he gets just a bunch of bank A-list. Robbery. Yeah, an A-list character, like A-list, A-list actors rather, playing the roles of Dante, Dante, and, yeah. and which yeah. is what I was calling for. Well, I mean, because I obviously, was saying when you take sh- good actors and you give them a good script, you're gonna get seven. Well, you're not I mean, gonna get you know, uh, Silent Night, Deadly Night Part Five. Right <laughs> now, no, no pitos and pinos. Yeah, no pinos and pitos. <laughs> Like like Dan said, Clerks happened a certain way because of circumstances it was a lightning strike. and yeah. whatever. Mm-hmm. But yeah, what I want to see it directed by Tarantino with like, Fuck you yeah. know, a bunch of Robert De Niro's. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe when <laughs> yeah. they do Clerks 3, uh, which I, I saw this week, Kevin Smith has finished his most recent draft and he's very happy with it. And we might get Clerks mm. 3 and I might go, yee. Awesome. That's good. Uh, That's good, Kevin. I'm excited. Yeah, it'll be good. It'll be good. (laughs) Don't contact me. I still haven't uh, (laughs) watched any other Kevin Smith movies. I said I was going to, but I never did. Uh, We'll we'll get around to it. We'll we'll watch Jersey Girl. (laughs) Cop Out. Cop Out. (laughs) I actually kind of liked Cop Out. I don't know. I mean, I I had such low expectations because the critics were so mean to it. I was like, oh, this is a serviceable action movie. No mm. dumber than any other action movie of the time, mm-hmm. but because they expected it to be clerks with machine guns, mm-hmm. 
They didn't like it, but it's fine. Whatever. We had to wait for Simon Pegg to do that. Yes, we did. And then it was Bad Boys 2 mm-hmm. and a Jallo. <laughs> Can we watch Jallo. Bad Boys 2, please? Uh, yeah. We don't have to watch the first one. The first one's fine, but the second one is such a like counterpoint to everything we've watched this season. Here's Here's what will tell me if we're watching part one. Have you ever seen Bad Boys, George? No, but with I th- Will Smith and Martin Lawrence. No, but I, th- I think I know of it. Though. I say we watch part two, but tell him to watch part one as well. I say we watch part two and tell him to watch part one and see if he can even tell that we're talking about different movies. <laughs> 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 I t- I just love all the ca- like the introduction to the characters and that that character development because it makes two so much better when you know who they are and why they are the way they are. That's the way. It's just like jumping in the Lethal Weapon, and but watching Lethal Weapon three first. Like, that's not as good, but the characters are fully developed. But you need to watch one just to see where they came from and why they are the way they are. Mm. But yeah, obviously two is a better movie per se. I don't know, but I like it a lot. I don't know I if it's you. good. It's it's very much in the Chuck Norris. Like mm. I watch them and they're fun, but boy, they, I can't endorse them. I like the bad guy in the first movie. He's he's good. I don't know, man. We'll, we'll head down that that action action road. Maybe we'll do a uh, summer break with action movies or something. Well, we'll you know, see. Memorial Day. Mm-hmm. Mm. I don't think mm. I'm really into action movies that much, guys. Hmm. Hmm. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just like man. <laughs> he's like. Hmm. I mean, they're not as tragic so then, as maybe other movies. So the f- but entire season has sucked for you. Is what you're telling. Well, I mean, we kind of, I mean no. First Blood's an action film. Yeah. Die Hard. Action. Dirty Harry. Yeah. Dirty Harry. Yeah. Action. Yeah. We haven't even shown you a uh, Schwarzenegger movie yet. At some point, we'll probably watch three or four of those. It's maybe not back to back. I mean, I'm still like, it. I'm not saying like, you know, I can't stand these movies, but like, you know, they're action movies are kind of like. They are what they are. Yeah. I hear you. I agree. Yeah. But the good ones are great. Like, Aliens is, like, the my favorite action film. And it's really a sci-fi, but it's sci-fi action. Right. But it does everything you want. It gives you a great script, great characters, awesome story, great filmmaking, and it has action. Well, he's already seen Jason X. I mean, he's already checked all this those boxes. This so. is true. This is true. Jeez. <sighs> Let's watch some more Tarantino movies. Mm. I mean, cool. now Travis, have you seen Once in a Pine, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood? I saw some of it. I have not <gasps> sat down and watched the whole thing. Here's but the I thing: have I'm going to tell you. Now, this is a real story about today. Watching Jackie Brown, I, I paused it at one point because I had to take care of something with the kids, and I look and I'm like, "Oh my god, I still have an hour left in this <laughs> movie." I sit down, I hit play, I blink, and the movie's over. Mm. It's so mm. well paced. That last hour just flew by. I didn't even realize. I was like, man, did I watch it on like 2X? Like, mm. how could it have possibly been an hour since I started? It's just so good. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, two and a half hours long. And I thought for like a year, I was like, ugh, who's got three hours to watch a movie? I don't. Ugh, I have children. I'm too busy. Finally, finally just sit down. I'm like, okay, kids are in bed. Wife and I go to watch it. Blink. Movie's over. And I'm just like, man. What is this Tarantino guy doing to me that he can make a two and a half hour, what would be a slog for any other director except maybe Nolan? Mm. And it just flies by, man. You know what's funny? Usually, like, the last hour of a Tarantino movie takes place in, like, 20 minutes of a regular director's movie. Mm. Hmm. It's usually in reverse. (laughs) The last (laughs) 20 minutes of, like, you know, the movie Crescendo you know, mm-hmm. like his happens in the last hour. It's a whole hour. Well, he spends all that time there. building the Jenga tower, and then he spends the last 45 minutes just blowing your mind. Yeah. It's like, okay, you spent all that time building all these characters, and now let's watch them play. Yep. I'm cool with that. Me too. So final verdict. You dig it? Absolutely. You will own it? Yeah. He's a Tarantino fan. I'm waiting for this one to come out on 4K. I will immediately buy that one on 4K. 
Well, Travis, do you want to tell our contestant what he's in for on the next <coughs> edition of the Remedial Film Class podcast? podcast? <laughs> we are <laughs> uh, watching the next a movie. movie that we are going to watch <laughs> is... Uh, Hold on. Can George guess? George. Oh. You want to guess? What do you think you're watching next based on our conversations this week? Terminator. Uh, Travis, no. tell him what he's won. <laughs> uh, you've won an all-expense-paid trip to Westworld. We are watching the 1974 classic, I believe, 74, Westworld. I have no idea what that we is. We are not going to tell you what it's about and why we're putting it where we're putting it. Very good. Have you ever heard of Westworld, George? N- I don't think so. Like, the, the title sounds familiar. It's been referenced recently a lot because there's actually a show on TV right now based on the on the movie. Oh. So. No, I I have no idea what the plot of that movie might be. Well, mm. when we do our spinoff show, the Remedial TV Class podcast, <laughs> we'll definitely watch season <laughs> one of Westworld, the TV show. But without uh, access to those uh, class schedules yet due to uh, mm. us all having grown COVID. up jobs. <laughs> and COVID. We'll and blame COVID. COVID, not the fact we're all just <laughs> old and busy. Uh, George, uh, you're... Walking in blind again. Mm. We just keep doing this. You guys this. have a knack for, for that. I kind of want to tell him who made the movie, but then I don't. Let's not tell him, because it's not important until it is important. Okay. We can save that for the show. All right, thanks for joining us on the Remedial Film Class Podcast. As always, you can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash remedialfilmpod. You can also join the Extra credit discussion group at facebook.com slash groups slash remedial film pod. We're also on Twitter and Instagram at, at remedial film pod. And you can even email us at remedial film pod at gmail.com. We'll see you in two weeks for Westworld, the movie, not the TV show. I haven't seen this movie in a long time, so I can't wait to watch it again. Oh man, it's one of my favorites. I'm trying to decide, like, the the big thing I'll be auditing this time, besides the fact you know that we're gonna have to talk about it, and I've got to sound smart and stuff. I'm gonna <laughs> audit whether or not the kids can watch it, like especially my older mm. kid, because I think it's almost okay, you know. Well, how old's your oldest? Eight. Eight, yeah. You're in a different spot than I am. Yeah. So you you have it good. I have yeah, George. George is my I can show him anything I want because he's a grown up. Kids mm-hmm. aren't quite <laughs> there yet. I hear you. Oh, believe me, I have I have so many movies, and I kept saying to my wife, I'm like, I'm not really sure when, like, this section, when do my kids watch this section, and when do my kids watch, so they're, I'm kind of working them up, I have all the worst ones are on, up high, they can't even see them, but it's like, that's what I want them to see, <laughs> that mm. top rack, mm. you know, so I'm like trying to s- ease them in. The fact that he's seen Halloween already is, is mind-boggling. But I think he's better off now. He's been watching. He's season six now of Walking Dead. I so, mean, if he has the attention span to get six seasons into a show that's essentially yeah. a soap opera with gore, he loves it, and it's more than that. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely. And you know what? Watching it binge makes it a lot better. Like oh, I remember, I, I remember much prefer the, to binge watch. Yeah, that because show. I remember all the breaks and the you know mid seasons and all. I said it breaks it up, but terrible. To, to actually watch it with him this quickly, the story meshes way better. It's There's no two, three-month break. There's no one-year break. That was my problem with uh, Game of Thrones and stuff. Like, just those breaks, kind of, you lose interest. You're like, you can't wait to the point where you don't even, you t- kind of forget about it. So, to watch ten seasons with him back-to-back, three or four episodes a night, or at least in the background, he's watching it. I'm kind of like doing other things, but mm. so yeah, his attention span's getting better. Now we can sit down and watch some longer movies. Well, I can think of a couple that maybe I'll recommend for him to watch with you. Mm. <laughs> he's definitely going to watch Jaws soon, so I can't wait till we do that. Oh, he's going to love that yeah. mechanical shark. They don't show him a lot. <sighs> I've never, I've actually never seen that movie. Oh, we know. 
<laughs> oh, we're aware. <laughs> it keeps coming up in the tally. <laughs> Just not really sure when. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm excited. Cool. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Holy mackerel. Well, I'm super excited. Travis, I think you're pretty excited, too, from what you were saying about Westworld. Westworld. And then we'll see what George thinks, because we're not going to tell him what it is. Now, I enjoy him not knowing. That's good. I've already received a couple messages about, oh, my God, George didn't know this. I'm like, oh, just wait till you hear First Blood. (laughs) 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 Uh, Good stuff. 